Yeah, just a minute, you guys. I'm going to walk you through it. Um, we'll get started, and I'll show you the ropes. I know a lot of you have been on Zoom calls before, um, and they might look a little different from this one. We're in what's called a webinar format. Um, a lot of it is it's, it's more set up for presentation. We will have a Q&A towards the end, so we'll be opening up for questions then. Um, but I'll, I'll walk you through it, don't worry. It's, your, your Zoom's not broken. It's doing exactly what it's supposed to do on this round. Okay, it's, it's just about to turn 6.05. We want to be respectful of you guys' time, so we're going to go ahead and get started. Uh, welcome, everybody, to the uh, Jefferson Chalmers Main Street Master Plan Meeting, August 27th, 2020. Uh, it's good to see everyone here. I'm just going to do a little bit of the, the housekeeping um, just to let you know we are operating out of Zoom. Uh, there won't be any poll questions today, so don't worry about being on the ready for poll questions. But we do have uh, a Q&A session at the end, um, but there's also a questions and answer box. You should, be able, you should see it on the panel at the bottom or wherever your panel is located. Um, if you have questions during the presentation and you just can't wait till the end, Go ahead and fire off your question to us, um, and we'll have somebody from the team look at those questions and answer them as best we can. Or uh, we may save your question to the end so that we can talk about it at length. Um, this is also being recorded and live streamed on Facebook Live. It's on the uh, East Jefferson Development Corporation page, or uh, as we call it, EJ DevCo. I am going to tell you why we're here. Uh, JEI and EJ DevCo create conditions to directly drive inclusive development and foster growth throughout the East Jefferson corridor and its adjoining neighborhoods. We ensure that long-term Detroit residents are able to benefit from the revitalization of our community through economic development, implementing clean and safety programs, and preventing displacement. So just a recap of last month, uh, we had a planning history where Josh talked about what was going on in terms of planning in Jefferson Chalmers before, giving you the history about JIPA. Um, and then we went into the overview of the master plan, which was uh, intense and had a lot of information. I'm sure people got a chance to look at the website and I'm sure you have questions about it. We're looking forward to that. Um, we talked about next steps. There was Q&A and announcements. Tonight's discussion, we're going to be doing uh, an update from Jefferson East. Um, 
because Josh Elling is going to, to take the lead on. Um, we'll, we'll reflect on the master plan, um, some action items, some current project updates, and we will have a, a healthy Q&A so you can get in there and ask your questions. And then we have a few announcements. So I am going to introduce Joshua Elling, who is going to take us through the JEI update. And Josh, I just gave you a little control, so please go right ahead. All right. Um, can everybody hear me okay? All right, everyone. Um, great, to, great to be here. Hope everyone's summer is going a-okay. I um, want to give you a quick update here. Um, there's lots more I could talk about, but we're really excited about that we are getting very close to being able to unveil the JI Neighborhood Resource Hub. So as you know, this is the rear of the, the Kresge building right there at Lakewood and Jefferson. And this 3,600 uh, square feet will house JEI's housing health and safety team. Um, and also provide us with some much needed engage, engagement space here uh, in the neighborhood. And we are so excited to be able to get back on street level here in, in Jefferson Chalmers. What's really key about this is really spearheaded by you know, your neighbor, uh, Michelle Lee, is an integrated intake and service delivery model for housing and resident services in Jefferson Chalmers. We really want this to be the one-step shop, where one-step, one-stop one shop, where people are looking for ways to improve their homes, fight off foreclosure, uh, deal with home repair issues, um, and just get information about ways they can, they can really plug into their neighborhood. This is the place where people will go and be plugged into an integrated intake system. So um, we have the uh, white box work on the inside of the space is continuing. Here's a little peek of, of what it kind of currently looks like. So, well, you know, initially when we were pre-COVID, you know, we initially envisioned this as a one big sort of wide open space. Uh, we're going to have section off here, a nice sort of engagement space. We'll have uh, some, you know, private counseling space when folks come in and get their financial literacy counseling and their financial coding and, and all of the, all of the stuff that requires a bit more privacy will be segmented off in some private counseling rooms. But then also we really want this in, in the sort of the big space you see down there to be where we're able to come together have master plan updates, also provide a space where EJ Devco can, can meet with residents to update them on projects. So it's gonna have a nice big layout. The, the challenge we're facing right now in, in the COVID environment is how do we phase the release of this space safely? Um, and so what you're probably gonna see here is, you know, hopefully you know, early first, fourth quarter, we'll be able to get Michelle and Crystal and, and you know, Jacqueline and Rebecca into this space. Uh, to sort of do their day-to-day -day operations. We'll build in a drop box so folks can drop off documents if they're applying for the 0% loan or the, uh, the property tax exemptions or whatnot. I think a second phase on this, depending on the severity of COVID, um, is then looking to create a sort of safe, contact-free interior space where we'd be able to walk folks through documents that have questions about applying for certain things in, in a safe manner, and then eventually be able to get to sort of appointment-based uh, counseling again one-on-one. -on -one. Now, my big dream, though, is, you know, once, once we get COVID behind us and, and, and we're all able to get back together in person, is really being able to utilize this space on an ongoing basis for engagement. I really miss the days, and I'm planning to be down here several days a week, too, but I miss the days in the old, in the old Jiba office when folks are able to walk in and walk right into my office and ask me questions. I miss being able to see everyone uh, that way. So, so hopefully we'll get to that soon. But initially, it's going to be sort of a limited rollout here based upon the severity of COVID. Um, one neat little feature I wanted to highlight that we are doing, we're kind of working with a design team right now to design the space in a way that's flexible, safe. Um, but also, many of you remember a year ago when we were doing Jazz and at the Vanity, we had worked with the Detroit Historical Society and the Detroit 67 Neighborhoods Project to interview residents to get their oral histories of the Vanity Ballroom. Um, these stories were then translated to a group of artists, a group of artists that were actually selected by a committee of Jefferson Chalmers residents to design murals based upon these, these histories. And so now we have these wonderful, we have four wonderful pieces of artwork 
that we are going to incorporate somehow into the build out of the of the Kresge building, the neighborhood resource hub, uh, hopefully to maybe frame out our engagement space. So just a neat little uh, little thing we're going to be working in uh, to help sort of define the space. And I just wanted to thank all the residents that were on the selection committee, the artists, and it's going to be very nice to finally get this this art up somewhere where it can be enjoyed by uh, by everyone. So that's sort of, uh, we're gonna work that into the design. Um, so we'll keep you posted um, on the timeline. Uh, we'll meet with the, the designer now to lay out the space, basically do that interior build out. The white box is pretty close to being done. And then depending on the severity of COVID, we'll look to maybe sort of, you know, see how we can interface with the public. But what you can expect initially is having some of our team members base there, a drop box for, uh, for documents or people are doing work with us. And then we'll sort of safely try to roll out uh, further use of that, that space. So that is sort of the big news that we have. Lots more to share. Um, you know, the teams are, are, are working diligently. Um, you'll hear from, from Eric and all the great EJ DevCo projects. Michelle and her team continue to provide all of the great servicing around housing. Crystal, the safety team is going gangbusters. We'll have some more announcements here as we're gonna roll out some, some different safety programming, some, some different housing programming. And one thing I will share with you, which makes this neighborhood resource hub so very critical, is that, you know, Jefferson East was selected by the city of Detroit as one of the first housing resource centers in the city of Detroit. And we're currently working with the city and some of our, our, our peer organizations, like, like you snap back and bridging communities, on, on how we integrate all of the city sort of supports around housing and so that you'll be able to access these through the neighborhood resource hub. So we'll keep you posted as that evolves, but uh, we're really excited about this and looking forward to, to getting back on the ground. And I look forward to the day when folks can just walk in and walk into my office because I, I really do miss everybody and um, miss being able to interact person to person. Aside from that, I hope you are all staying healthy. I hope you are all uh, keeping the faith and uh, fighting the good fight. I miss you all. But with that, um, Lou, I'll turn it back over to you. Thanks, Josh. Um, so we are going to go into master plan and our master plan, master planner, uh, Derek Scott is in the house and we wanna give him a, a chance to to talk on the master plan a little bit. Derek, I just shared the screen with you. You're ready to go. You may want to unmute yourself too. All right, I think when you shared your screen with me, my unmute button went away magically. So I figured <laughs> it out here. All right, so uh, good evening everyone and thanks for joining us. Uh, so glad to see everybody. Uh, Josh got to talk about really cool stuff uh, today. And so I hope we get to talk about uh, some more uh, great stuff here and um, really uh, open up the floor. I think we're going to not, um, uh, we're not, uh, we don't have a long program tonight, but I think uh, the goal is to really get some feedback from those that attended the last uh, uh, master planning session and, and got a chance to go through the website and, and see some feedback uh, and hear your questions uh, that you may still have. So uh, for those that did participate last month, you saw the, the full presentation of the master plan that is now uh, live and you can go to our website, ejdevco.com uh, and click in the top right and access the, the entire site and be able to go through it at your own pace. Uh, I think we can drop the link as well uh, here uh, to, to anyone who wants to access it. Uh, but um, the, the, the next steps from the master plan process is really to, to dig in and, and start uh, implementing the the next phases of the master plan and so uh, one big piece of this is the selection of businesses as we continue to fill in retail spaces uh, so we have had a history of presenting uh, businesses to the community here and uh, taking uh, those business allowing those businesses to present uh, what uh, they would like to see happen uh, in the corridor 
uh, in, in their businesses and what their concept is uh, relative to what we've heard from the plan and then giving community members the opportunity to really provide us with feedback on whether they're the right fit or not. Uh, so at the next community meeting, uh, we will uh, have some presentations more than likely from a, a couple of businesses that are yeah. looking to tenant a couple of our uh, uh, spaces, whether it be in the um, the Kresge building or a couple of upcoming projects uh, that we'll uh, talk about here in a moment. And then uh, we want to continue this process of allowing you to vote on active developments uh, and uh, helping us to uh, make sure that as developments are coming online that you have uh, some voice in those developments as they happen and making sure that uh, we're getting it right as we begin to come out of the ground with many of these projects. So uh, stay tuned for that, but those are uh, a couple of the big pieces that uh, we'll dive into over the next uh, several sessions. So I want to uh, give some quick uh, highlights from last month. And, and some of these slides for some reason aren't populating fully here, Lou. Um, it's not loading. So I can I can speak to it though. Uh, so at the at last month's meeting, we had 149 people that participated via Zoom, so live in our uh, master plan presentation and because the video or because the zoom was also recorded there was uh, another 900 uh, plus hits as of last week another 900 people that went back and reviewed and were able to uh, participate uh, via the zoom link that was provided and, and rewatch it and participate in some of the polling uh, that happened there uh, so we were able to really capture some really good uh, feedback from uh, many of you that participated and provided us insight on the data uh, and then you may have noticed that a lot of these were covered in um, uh, in many of the, the media outlets and news outlets. There was some good coverage. And one of the things that I really want to highlight is that we were happy of the number of resident voices that were able to uh, be captured in this process to share both your concerns about development as it happens, uh, but also sharing uh, the enthusiasm around what's coming, uh, the, the type of development activity that's been happening in the corridor and just the excitement overall of, of the plan as it unfolds. Uh, so uh, there were media hits in Crane's Detroit Business, Detroit News covered it, Model D, uh, D Business, uh, Revitalization uh, Journal of, of Urban and Rural Environmental Planning, Detroit Free, Free Press, and then a few other uh, uh, podcast, including the Daily Detroit and some other uh, outlets as well. And so all in all, uh, the, the, the master plan uh, uh, presentation from last week hit about 2.7 million uh, viewers or listeners across these all of these different platforms. So we're really excited about the amount of feedback that we've just heard in the last month. And we're, we're continuing to collect a lot of that information and uh, continue to hear a lot of your feedback on, on this plan. So, um, Lou, if, if you want, I, the slides are coming up good on my computer. If you want to give me control to share my screen, I'll just uh, um, share my screen here so that they come up clearly here. All right, there we go. So, um, the next step is, is are these focus groups that we're looking to move into uh, which uh, many of you indicated that you were interested in in focus groups and participating uh, in one way or another in, in helping to move the plan forward. And so there's nine different areas, and I encourage you, uh, if you have not signed up for an area or you're interested in the area, uh, to reach out to us and uh, sign up to participate and get information um, in each of these areas so that you can be involved. Uh, one is in public space and street life. Um, there's a neighborhood needs group, which uh, will help us uh, to continue to assess what are some of the most critical needs uh, of, of the neighborhood as far as amenities and different things that we want to see uh, coming to the corridor. Uh, there's an overall arts and culture group uh, really will focus on uh, the corridor as it expands in that area. Um, business coalition group, which are not just business, not just open to business owners, but open to um, residents and other community stakeholders who 
uh, want to be involved in supporting our businesses and understanding uh, what type of uh, resources are, are needed and what type of uh, support uh, each of our businesses need. And then there's a transportation focus group, a youth or young people's group. Uh, that youth focus group really is a group that we want to target um, those that are under the age of 18 uh, to have a voice in, in what ultimately becomes in the corridor. So oftentimes in many of these planning processes, uh, the, the youth voice uh, gets lost uh, in, in the process. And we wanna make sure that as the, 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 the master plan continues to evolve, that there's voice for, for young people as well. And then there's overall real estate design group. And this will continue to focus on the design intent of the corridor, uh, preserving some of the historical features of the area as well as uh, making sure that as uh, development happens that uh, the design um, is uh, consistent with the character of the Jefferson Chalmers neighborhood and the vision uh, that the community has for that. And then lastly, uh, there, there will be development specific groups around each of these development projects, which we'll talk about uh, in a moment, uh, some of those that are coming up uh, really soon. So if any of these groups interest you, and you see any of them, uh, we encourage you to shoot us uh, a message, shoot an email, or, or you can even flag us in the, in the comment box uh, or uh, section right now in the Q&A section and just notify us that you're interested in being a part of one of these groups uh, and our team is tracking uh, the comments and the communication. We'll take down your contact info and make sure we follow up with you on, on each of these. And then we just want to keep continue to keep this present uh, and, and sort of front of mind that our inclusive development principles are really, really important uh, because this is what continues to drive the work that we do. Uh, so making sure that as development happens, that it, it's consistent with the community's vision uh, for uh, Jefferson Chalmers, but that it also does not displace uh, existing businesses or existing residents. Uh, that we're creating quality jobs and that we're prioritizing uh, that job creation uh, for local residents and, and Detroiters, uh, making sure that we're prioritizing ownership opportunities uh, through community equity. And so uh, we talked a little bit about this last time uh, and we're gonna share a couple of opportunities tonight uh, for you to participate in uh, equity opportunities on uh, some of these development projects. Uh, and that means, uh, you know, being able to uh, provide capital as in, in, in sort of an ownership structure that will allow you an opportunity to benefit from the development that's happening in the area, as opposed to us going out first to uh, investors uh, who uh, will benefit from development, but don't uh, necessarily live uh, within the neighborhood or are not uh, community stakeholders uh, in, in the Detroit community. Uh, and then making sure that we're prioritizing local contractors. So many of you on the call here know somebody who uh, is a contractor or subcontractor, or does carpentry, does general labor work. Uh, we want to make sure we're putting uh, folks in the community to work. Uh, so um, if you know those individuals and you know somebody who should be swinging a hammer or hanging drywall or, or painting a wall in one of these buildings or doing demo work, uh, we wanna make sure that uh, we're allowing for those opportunities to happen uh, and that uh, you're participating or someone you know uh, who's in Detroit, uh, particularly uh, Detroit residents, uh, but also prioritizing uh, MBEs or minority business enterprises and women business enterprise firms uh, for employment on, on these sites. And then um, making sure that uh, housing is, is affordable and attainable, That's that continues to remain a priority and making sure that we're prioritizing deep affordability. Uh, you'll hear about the Marlboro Apartments uh, here shortly where there's already a, a large demand that, you know, we've gotten feedback uh, from many, many residents uh, who are interested in those 23 units that'll come online here very soon. And so we wanna make sure that we can continue to meet that pent up demand uh, with continue to provide deep levels of affordability on, on housing and ultimately providing accessible price points. So pricing that makes sense. So not just, you know, a new burger restaurant uh, that comes into the neighborhood with a $20 burger, but a place where uh, folks in the, in the neighborhood can actually come, uh, sit down, enjoy a good meal with their family, 
uh, and continue to come back over and over again and, and support the businesses in the community. Uh, so these are all things that are important to our uh, inclusive development principles and we wanna make sure that uh, if, you, if there are other things that you feel are important to ensure that uh, the master plan happens in an inclusive way. We want you to share those uh, ideas with us. Um, those are also things that you can drop in the comments, but also uh, continue to reach out to us and just share what are your concerns, what are some of the challenges that you think uh, um, uh, may uh, appear as a result of development happening in the community. And we would love to try to work towards uh, solutions that make sure that uh, development happens in an inclusive way. So with that, uh, we are going to move into project updates. And then I think uh, after updates, we're off into our Q&A section. So uh, I'm just going to blow this up a little bit more so that um, we can see this a little better here. All right. Lou, am I doing project updates here as well? Marcus should be doing them. All right, so I am going to uh, turn this over uh, to Marcus to take us through uh, project updates. Awesome. Um, perfect, so um, good evening, everybody. Uh, thanks for joining us once again. Um, Again, my name is Marcus King, uh, the uh, architect on the East Jefferson Development Corporation team. Um, so what we're going to do here is just walk you through a couple of uh, projects that are um, um, either in pre-development or under construction. Just kind of give you updates on what we're thinking about, uh, or what we're doing in terms of progress for uh, some of our up and coming projects. Um, so first, um, you know, looking at the Vanity Ballroom um, building that I know a lot of you guys are familiar with, um, you know, our plan is still to um, uh, uh, inhabit the Schwinn Bike Shop, the building that you see on the right there, the, sh um, the white building. Um, uh, the plan is that is for that building to be our um, offices in the in the neighborhood in the East Jefferson, uh, the Jefferson Chalmers neighborhood. Uh, that's still our plan. Um, uh, some of you may have noticed a barrier around Vanity Ballroom at the um, uh, around the ground floor of the Vanity Ballroom. Uh, that was put up for uh, safety safety reasons. Um, some of you may may have noticed some pieces, uh, some small pieces of the facade falling off. Um, um, and so for safety reasons, um, City of Detroit has required us to put up a barrier to uh, you know, protect citizens that are walking along the street um, and, um, and also uh, that will allow us to protect and collect any, any fallen debris from the, from the, uh, from the structure. Um, we, we are um, hopefully moving into pre-development for uh, this project pretty soon. Uh, the plan is still to uh, stabilize the facade as well as put on a, um, a new roof um, so that we can contain and control the environment. And then, um, you know, there'll be some engagement around, you know, what the program for the inside of the Vanity Ballroom becomes. Uh, many of you have already mentioned things that you would like it to become, things that you would like to see uh, be served inside the building. Um, and we've, we have a record of those. Um, and when the time is right, we'll pull those out and have a larger discussion about what the program of the Vanity Ballroom needs to become. Marcus, you're muted. Can you guys hear me?
We can hear you great now. Can you hear me? Yes. Okay, perfect. Um, uh, re remind me where um, the, the last time you guys didn't hear me so I can pick up from there. I'm, I'm, some of my Zoom controls are kind of wonky, so I, I can't. We, did, we didn't hear any updates on 14522. Perfect, okay. Uh, uh, 14522, so this is the project that we're moving into active development on. Um, uh, we have begun the process of talking with uh, potential funders. We're, we're getting uh, all in the process of getting all the monies together to do the project. Um, also in the process of getting a design team that uh, I will be in charge of, of, of managing uh, in, in the context of this project. And just to remind you of, you know, some of the program uh, that will be here. So we'll, we'll eventually have two uh, commercial suites uh, on the ground floor, uh, one on each side. Um, and there will be, um, uh, there will be three units on the top floor, the second floor, two of which will be affordable. Um, I don't quote me on this, but I think we're offering them um, around the 50 to 60% AMI range. Um, um, but we can get back to you on the actual affordability rate uh, levels that we're providing those units are uh, units at, but three units nonetheless. Um, and like I said, we're moving into active development on this project, relatively small project um, uh, that the team and I um, are, are starting from the ground up. So I think the expected delivery date is um, mid next year. Uh, time so that's um, for full construction mid mid to you know fall time fall sometime next year and um, you know once we get closer to a completed building you know we will do um, you know proper um, lease up um, um, trying to find tenants for the units uh, but also trying to find tenants uh, again for the two commercial spaces that will be at the bottom uh, roughly about 800 square feet uh, each um, uh, the units at the top uh, range from a studio, and I think uh, the other two are um, two one bedrooms. Um, so uh, keep a lookout for more information on this particular project. And next slide. Fourteen three two six, uh, purely commercial building, also one that we're moving. Uh, into active development alongside 14522, uh, the one that we just showed you. Um, uh, again, a simple, simple building, uh, no residential here, all commercial. Um, we're looking to potentially use the adjacent lot uh, as well within this development. And so we're, the team and I are currently negotiating, you know, what, what that could become. Um, you know, we're, we're thinking some sort of um, pedestrian a uh, park that that will allow uh, some interaction between what goes on in the building. Uh, most likely thinking some sort of restaurant uh, or shared restaurant space. Um, so uh, we're in the process of gathering the design team and engineering team for this building as well as putting together the funds to do this project. So uh, alongside 14522, uh, stay tuned for more detailed updates on what happens between uh, this project. And to our two projects that are currently under construction, the Marlboro Apartments, um, exciting that we are getting close to delivering 23 units in the Jefferson Chalmers neighborhood. Uh, we, um, so I'll start with the 910 building, which will deliver first. The 910 building will have eight units, um, seven three bedrooms and a two bedroom unit. Uh, which we think can be used for a variety of things, getting a lot of good hits uh, and, and interest on uh, both buildings. And in fact, uh, I think over, over the last week, um, since we've released and started to uh, started to uh, market and 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 launch the lease up uh, phase of this project, we've received over 125 verifiable hits of people that are interested in um, you know renting an apartment in one of these buildings. Uh, so that's a good sign that lets us know that the demand, um, uh, that, the, that the demand is here that you guys want to see and need uh, affordable uh, residential units in the neighborhood. And you know, really excited to you know inch closer into uh, to completion on these projects. 
Uh, on the 910 building, you will b begin to start to see uh, some differences on the building. Um, um, there's a lot of close up uh, and uh, stuff happening inside and also the historic windows are going on, uh, are going, uh, are, were delivered today, uh, starting today and will slowly be implemented and integrated into the building. Um, so that building will be drastically different over the next, uh, over, over the course of the next four to five weeks or so. Um, and then uh, 910 or the 1031 building on the north side of Jefferson will follow a few months after the delivery of the 910 building. Um, <clears throat> but we're still planning on having both buildings, the entire 23 units delivered and available for lease up by the end of the year. Um, and so a, a few housekeeping notes on this particular project, you know, we, we have unfortunately, <clears throat> excuse me, we have unfortunately um, uh, had a couple of, of um, uh, uh, break-ins on, on the northern building. Uh, and so, you know, we're, we're sort of galvanizing all of our resources and power to, you know, become more vigilant uh, on the buildings and our assets in the, in the Jefferson Chalmers corridor. Um, but we also ask um, if, if any of you guys have, you know, see anything that, that's happening around any of, any of the buildings, not just these two, two buildings, but any of the buildings along the corridor, that you please let us know um, um, so that we can, you know, take the proper steps to uh, remedy, um, you know, any breaches in the building, any stolen materials. Um, you know, all of these things seek to set us back. Uh, uh, from ultimately delivering on, you know, buildings and projects and developments that you guys, uh, that we all say we want here in the Jefferson Chalmers community. So I ask you to, you know, keep a lookout when you guys are walking down the street or driving down certain blocks. If you see anything that doesn't look right, you know, feel free to shoot, you know, Lutalo or myself or Crystal an email uh, so that we're aware of uh, certain things that don't look right, and we can come check it out and alert the proper um, individuals and, and organizations. So, um, um, so but but at any rate, um, Marble Apartments will be delivering uh, pretty soon. You'll also be seeing a website uh, in about uh, in about two weeks uh, that will have all the details about these buildings. That will list all the square footages for the buildings, um, um, as well as. Uh, um, uh, pricing rates, so all the information that you'll need to know uh, about uh, leasing uh, uh, a rental apartment in one of these buildings will be available on the project web project specific website um, uh, in a couple of weeks or so. So look out for that. Next, uh, Lou, thank you. And lastly, I think this is the last uh, project update is the Kresge building, uh, which Josh actually gave a really good uh, uh, preamble to uh, on progress. Um, uh, the, the progress in the rear space where JEI will relocate is uh, just about done. Uh, there's a few things on the floor uh, that need to be refinished, but all of the systems are in, the drywalling is done. Uh, 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 the mechanical systems are, are up and running, bathrooms are just about finished, um, and I'm sure many of you already know that the parking lot is completed. So, you know, we'll be wrapping up on that, um, the base building uh, pretty soon. And as Josh mentioned, we've already begun the process of beginning to uh, design and fit out, so to speak, the space for JEI to actually move in and operate and continue to provide the great neighborhood services that you know our housing and clean and safe team uh, deliver to the neighborhood on a daily basis um, and then uh, the rear space uh, the front space excuse me um, uh, which was at uh, which used to be on the kitchen uh, construction is continuing to go on that space um, uh, we are still looking for a tenant uh, we we've toured a couple of potential restaurant tours in the space um, uh, all offering different things uh, but nothing has been uh, solidified and, 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 and signed with a contract yet. So, you know, uh, if, if anybody still has their ear to the ground and knows of a potential tenant that would love to lease, you know, 3,000 square feet of, of, of prime restaurant space along, you know, one of Detroit's major corridors, you know, please feel free to reach out to myself or Lutalo and, um, you know, one of myself and my colleague, colleagues and I can, um, there he is, David Howe. Uh, will help um, uh, to tour any of those individuals or organizations in the space. 
Um, and, and again, you can also reach out to David Howe, uh, whose picture and name, name and contact information is up on your screen now. So uh, with that, I think that ends our project updates. I'm going to hand it back to, to Lou uh, to take us home. Thanks, Lou. Yes, sir. Uh, let me trying to take control of Derek's uh, screen here. Here we go. So next steps. We're going to have our ongoing monthly meetings. Uh, we will be going into the focus groups. That's why we asked you definitely let us know which focus group you want to be a part of. Uh, during this q and I'm going to go back so everybody can see the focus groups if you want to write them down or take a snapshot with your phone or or whatever, because we, we want to know which groups you want to be a part of. Do not feel like you have to just be a part of one group. If, if you're passionate about more than one thing, let us know that, because we can get you in more than one focus group. Or if you're only passionate about one thing, that's OK, too. Um, and we'll be looking at uh, community members added to the EJ DevCo board, so that the community's voice is, is heard even on the board level. Uh, see. If you got questions, I've got answers. Um, here's my email address and phone number. Feel free to call me. Um, try and be respectful of time, of course, but I'm available all day, just about every day. And now we have the Q&A session. And Gwen already has her hand up. Where'd you go, Gwen? Uh, Gwen, I'm going to let you talk so we can hear. So, Luke, Luke, before we before we jump to questions, I just want to um, uh, highlight or uh, address. I saw a, a comment coming in. Um, there was uh, a demo that happened on the corridor uh, earlier uh, or toward the end of last week. Uh, so one of the buildings on uh, between Ashland and uh, Manistique, uh, you saw that come down, and that was a uh, a demo that an emergency demo that happened uh, due to the safety of that building. So we have been in touch with that particular landowner who, um, if if you all recall from the master plan, there's a a Manistique infield development that will go on that site. So that that demo is uh, while that demo was uh, planned to happen at some point, uh, it, it happened a little bit quicker uh, at the discretion of the city just because of. Uh, the more emergent need uh, from a safety perspective to have that building removed. Some of the um, uh, facade was coming down on the street and so it was posing a safety hazard. So that building uh, has been demoed and uh, if, if you've been by in the last couple of days there was a big hole in the ground and, and they're beginning to backfill that hole uh, and, and, and uh, closing off that site. Uh, so that de demolition was not a part of uh, development activity. It was you know a more emergent uh, need for for a demo that was ordered by the city of Detroit, uh, but it does not impact uh, the future and development on that site, which is is uh, consistent with the uh, uh, the master plan there. So just want to give folks uh, that update. So I know we're going to jump into Q and A uh, again. I want to encourage people to use the uh, Q and A box uh, for for questions. Uh, so if you have a question, type it in there and we'll, we'll begin to answer them. And then if for those that can't use the box, uh, there's the raise your hand uh, feature and Lou will start to call on individuals uh, for, for, Q, for questions. Thanks, Derek. Um, yeah, if you have a question and you want, if you can fire it off in the Q&A box, that'd be really helpful because we can track those really easily and we can follow up on questions as well. I'm going to start with Gwen because she's had her hand up. She's been very patient. Hey, Gwen. I think I unmuted you. Let me make sure I did. Uh-oh. Gwen, I'm trying to unmute you. It seems like it's not working. Link. Hmm. When it doesn't seem to be working. I'm going to ask Linda to talk and while she's Hi, doing that. Can you hear me now? There you are, Gwen. How are you? Hey, look, I've been working on this since the last two meetings to make sure that I get in. 
Um, good evening, first. Good evening. And I like to. I have a couple of questions, and I'm going to start off with one that I had to do a written comment because I couldn't get in, and it was concerning the bike lanes. And I did several surveys myself, and a group of us have gotten together. This community said we did not want bike lanes, and we continuously are pushed in this community with having them. There are so few people, I even suggested that JEI, EJ, DEFCO, you all put people strategically on Jefferson from Alter to Connor. You check at any given time, any day of the week, there are so few people, maybe about six people every now and then. And the other thing, uh, when I spoke uh, Marquise King last meeting, I posted the same thing. And his concern was, did I not like bike lanes? Bike lanes are not necessary when People say that they don't want it. It's like you thrust bike lanes on people anyway. That's not what we ask for. And the few people that ride in those bike lanes, it's not conducive to have one whole lane of traffic taken up and to make a right-hand turn if you have one person in a lane, bags traffic up at least one and a half blocks. So what, have you all did your survey yet? Yeah, I'll, I'll, um, I'll hop in here. So thanks, thanks uh, Ms. People for, for, for raising that, that question again. I know that it was thrown out at the uh, last meeting. And um, one of the, so, so, so two, Two comments on on the bike lanes, and and I know we we mentioned a little bit about it here um, during the master plan presentation. Is so there was two two differing opinions on the bike lanes. Uh, so there's there's one group that um, is supportive of the bike lanes, and um, their supportiveness of the bike lanes did not come. Uh, absent their criticism of the lack of uh, education around the bike lanes and the need for safety, uh, uh, more, more safety measures around the bike lanes themselves. And so that, that represented one group of people. Um, there was also a second group of individuals who um, uh, had a disdain for the bike lanes in general. And so from, from the surveys that were done that were conducted by the city uh, of Detroit relative to the, to the education on it, um, there were more people in that data and we're happy to, we can send that out and share that. We'll find the report and share it. Uh, but in that report, it showed that there were more people who were in favor of the bike lanes when surveyed from the community than those that were opposed. Uh, but from those that were in favor, that there was a strong need and a demand to make sure that uh, there were more, there was more safety around the bike lane. So in um, uh, both um, signage, uh, as well as uh, striping, uh, as well as also being able to identify to motorists um, where uh, the blind spots may be uh, relative to, to bike traffic. And so those were uh, sort of the two prevailing things that have come out. Uh, as, as, as to your question relative to making sure, or, or JI or EJ Devco, us going out, I know um, you mentioned that uh, to me once, both in this community meeting and in a, in a separate uh, 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 meeting. Um, and um, one of the things that we've continued to see is that there are people using the bike lanes and, and residents of Jefferson Chalmers who are using them, uh, including a family, uh, a family of five that, that I see often that live in Jeff Chalmers um, who um, uh, use, use it quite frequently and they, they uh, go back and forth up and down uh, the Jefferson corridor. And one of their concerns, uh, as well as many of the other families that I've talked, spoken to that use them, uh, is simply about safety 
uh, and and motorists respecting the 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 the, the speed limit, as well as uh, some more enforcement around parking people who park in the bike lanes. And so I do know that there are people that are using it. Some people have uh, deferred to go up to Kerchival because they feel safer on their bikes on Kerchival than they do on Jefferson. So really, the feedback that we continue to hear is about enhanced safety. Uh, but from the surveys that were conducted, there's a prevalence of individuals, more of a prevalence of individuals who wanted to see the bike lanes than those who were opposed to it. Hey, Derek, uh, we have a question in the Q&A that probably should be answered live as opposed to typed. Uh, what kind of dedication to sustainable energy is there in the development of the buildings? Thanks, Lou. And, and I, I just want to make sure, Ms. Uh, People said she had a couple of questions, so I want to make sure oh. we got all of her questions. I don't know if she's still on mute. She is. Let me, let me, I'm sorry. Let me fix that. Okay. Um, that was part of my question, but I would say, Derek, that five or six people in this community does not answer to, we had over 600 people and the majority of our survey, over 300 people said that they didn't want a bike lane, but I'm gonna leave that alone for right now because uh, a handful of people does not meet the majority. And I'm gonna move on. And the other thing is the written comments that were given and that I gave, they're not answered uh, in the uh, question and answers live session. So maybe next time and, and moving forward, when questions are asked, can you kind of like interject them into um, the framework so that everybody can hear the questions that are on the sideline as well? Yeah, I'll, 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 and Derek, I'll let you respond. I'll, um, Gwen, again, thank you for the comments. Um, first, I just want to make sure that you know, you know that my intention was not to offend you. I was essentially just asking the question, um, you know, to have a discussion. Um, but I think your your suggestion at the end there is a is a good one. Um, um, you know, we can possibly interject some of these questions that you know we're getting uh, in the chat uh, that maybe not everybody's paying attention to, and sort of uh, answer them in a larger form. I I have to say that last time. Uh, there were just a lot of questions that were being filled it. Um, so, you know, I apologize if if I didn't answer your question in the way no, you no. would like it, you would have liked it answered, but. Um, no, it was yeah, condescending. Really, say it again? It was condescending. Like, why don't I like the bike lanes? Uh, am I opposed to it? No, it's just that in this country, supposedly majority rules. It was not favored, and we were told in November when they first came out that they would remove them, but they're not removing them. And, and the more we say bike lanes were not what we asked for or want, you continuously are having them. And, and saying how five people ride, three people ride, that's not a majority. Okay. Well, I, ap I apologize uh, for, for, for coming off as condescending. That was not my intention at all. So I, I apologize for that part, uh, that portion. Uh, Thank you. you. Forgive me. Yeah, so, so yeah, I think, um, because you made a great uh, suggestion. I think um, much like we're going to do here in a second, there's questions that come up in the, the Q&A forum. So we'll try to get to them. I know our Q&A session, we don't always have an extended amount of time. So we try to answer as many questions in the live form as possible. But then also, if there's some that can be answered while the conversation is happening, I think the team's trying to do that. Uh, but what we can also do is post uh, to, the, to the master plan site. We can uh, post these questions afterwards uh, with the answers to them as well uh, in, in the, the same documents where we post all the other uh, information so that people can go back and historically look at it. Um, and then I, I just want to make a note uh, relative to the bike lanes. It's not necessarily, the bike lanes aren't something that uh, JEI or EJ DEVCO directly controls. It is a part of the larger streetscape uh, plan uh, for the city of Detroit, striping all the way from 
uh, down Jefferson from Alter Road all the way down to uh, 375 or into the um, commercial, the, the uh, business, central business district. And so, you know, again, the, the engagement that was done that I, that I referenced was a part of the city's larger um, uh, engagement work and activity around those bike lanes. And that's where that majority opinion came from. Uh, was was from that work. So um, again, I, we continue to note that that is a, a area that has been raised as a concern and, and making sure that we understand what are some of the things that can help uh, mitigate some of the impacts of the concerns that have been addressed by the larger group. Eric, if I could share one thing, this is Josh. Um, the other critique I get of the bike lines a lot are actually from gross pointers and they grumble that they can't speed through Jefferson Chalmers as easily anymore. So I think, you know, part of what we looked at with the bike lanes was not, not just bike at access, but also how do you sort of calm traffic? So it's a, it's a, it's a, it's a big look at the big, the big thing. But Derek, I saw a comment. Some people wanted to know about any issues about, about uh, uh, flooding and temporary long-term measures. Um, uh, flooding, so I'd be happy to give folks an update to that question that was raised uh, on the on the chat too. So the the big thing on flooding, I've, I, unfortunately, Frank, I don't have uh, Frank Bach asked this question. I don't have any any new information from last time. We've been reaching out to sort of city officials to see, you know, what is the you know long term solution for for the, the the flooding issues along along the river and the canals. And so I'm hopefully going to have a conversation with uh, some folks in the administration uh, later this week or early next week. So I might have some uh, some updates there. But we continue to push on this uh, on sort of all levels of government to see what the uh, the uh, uh, longer term solution might be about. Um, and your other comments about the the Creekside homes, uh, we'll have to take a little dive into there. I have not actually dove into that uh, issue in a while, but uh, it is on our radar to, to try to dive into. So that's Thanks, what Josh. I got on that. Thanks, Josh. I want to go back to um, Lynn's question about uh, uh, what kind of dedication to sustainable energy is there in the development of the buildings. Uh, and so uh, Marcus uh, provided an answer that we're, we try to integrate sustainability into every project we do. Uh, for example, the Cresby building has LED light, uh, LED on timers, uh, other lighting sources. We're also exploring uh, solar, um, uh, the potential for solar energy in, in a lot of our buildings as well, um, and uh, adopting a solar, uh, a, uh, not solar, a sustainable framework uh, plan for all of our design. Uh, so a set of standards similar to our inclusive standards, having a set of standards around sustainability uh, but one of the the other uh, sustainable features that we have, which is not sustainable energy, but um, addresses uh, stormwater management is, is the inclusion of green stormwater infrastructure in all of our projects. Uh, so th those are a few things that we're doing around um, sustainable energy and, and sustainable uh, resources as well. Um, but um, Lynn, I, I, I would encourage you if you're interested in, in that particular area um, that uh, Marcus uh, and and team are, are are working through a set of uh, sustainable um, uh, or sustainability uh, requirements or or baseline standards, and we'd love to have some input of uh, from community members on what some of those important features might be. Um, I see a question. Go ahead, Luke. We have, we have another question uh, in the Q and A. Uh, Crystal wants to know if you can please share, if available on the restructuring of East Jefferson Avenue and the infrastructure upgrades they're planning? Yeah, so thanks for that question, Crystal. As, as you know, that's, that falls into the wheelhouse of uh, the city and um, uh, uh, um, between Public Works and the, and the planning department as well. So we do know it, it, the, the plan, the capital improvement plan had called for the improvements to begin in 2021. Uh, for the Jefferson Chalmers area, um, the engagement work that happened with Jeff Chalmers residents with um, some of you remember Maria Galarza from the planning department who's now in public works or with GSD, um, who has uh, uh, 
plan this work for 2021. We do we have heard that there's some uh, with with COVID and some of the priorities at the city level with the the bond that was issued for many of these improvements that some of that timing may be delayed. Uh, so uh, the tentative plan was for 2021. We haven't heard anything differently on whether or not uh, that has been impacted and will be pushed back or if uh, the timing will continue to stay the same. Uh, but that streetscape and restructuring, uh, as some of you may or may not know, includes uh, replacing much of the water main line under the Jefferson, Ch the Jefferson Ave um, uh, street. Uh, which is sort of too small uh, currently, which is why there's a lot of uh, flooding and, and stormwater overflow in the area. Um, and it also includes uh, some streetscape improvements as well that, that Crystal uh, mentioned. Derek, we have another question. Um, oh, and just so you guys know, I pulled back up the focus groups on the screen for those who wanted to see them again. Um, just let us know which one you're interested in. Uh, you can send us emails, make a phone call, however you want to get the information to us. Uh, the next question was, will JEI assist those who live north of Jefferson? Many in this area have limited resources for the most modest home repair. Hey, Lou, I can, I can take that. And hey, Harold, uh, it's, it's great, to, great to see you. And, and thanks for asking that question. And the, the short answer is yes. I mean, when we look at the, the housing, uh, the neighborhood resource hub and the housing resource centers, we're looking at, at the catchment area that includes, you know, north of Jefferson as well, too, there in the Riverbend neighborhood. So one of our major priorities as an organization is to continue to identify additional cost-free resources for individuals to be able to improve their homes and make and make home repairs. We know a lot of folks are not able to qualify for the 0% home repair loan. So a, a key crux of sort of this integrated service model that, that, that Michelle has worked very well to put together and that we're lining up with the city as a housing resource center is how we can bring all of these resources to bear. Like how can you layer in uh, you know, senior emergency home repair, the lead abatement dollars, the 0% the dollars, the state emergency assistance. So this layered approach is kind of what we take when any homeowner comes through our door to make sure we can, we can stay in their home. Because a lot of times someone might come in and say, I want to redo my bathroom, but it'll realize that actually, you know, you, we need to address uh, water issues uh, from water penetration in the roof or, or there's a, a furnace that goes out. So Michelle and her team, do a really good job of, of taking a case management approach with individuals. So I would just say, Harold, if you know of individuals north of Jefferson and Riverbend that need help, you know, get us their name and number so we can do the outbound calling to get these folks plugged into the resources and start uh, tying them into to different forms of, of, of home repair. The, the broader issue is, and this is, is a systemic issue is how to identify more resources for that. Um, I think you heard me say the number before when we did an analysis with our friends at Rebuilding Together many years ago, we estimated conservatively there was need for almost 2.87 million in roof repairs just in Jefferson Chalmers alone. So this is, this is the holy grail that we're working towards, but I think with this new integrated service approach, us continuing to find additional resources. Uh, this is really going to be a big focus of JEI going forward over, over the next several years. So um, any more questions, uh, Harold, you know, feel free to reach out to myself or Michelle, and uh, we'll want to get you guys plugging up there too. Thanks. Thank you. Oh, Linda, you have your hand back up. I was wondering where you went. Okay, I'm up. I think I unmuted you, Linda. Or maybe not. Let's try it again. Um, Can you hear me now? Hi, Linda. Hi, how is everyone? Fantastic. Okay, Great. my question, I have two questions. And my first question is regarding the property that's owned and under the control of JEI. I would like for you to list those out for us and uh, tell us how you acquired those properties. I think it's important for us to know that. All the properties that JEI either owns and or control within the Jefferson Chalmers area and how those properties were acquired. That's my first question. And if you can't answer it tonight, if you can list them out and put them up on your website, I would appreciate that. 
or however you intend to get the information, but I really need to know that information. Also, on the last meeting, you showed your consultant team, which uh, appeared to be a team of um, all white male people, people in an 80% black community. I find it a little insulting that you would have an all white male consulting team. How did you acquire this team? What do they do? What do you pay them? What are you consulting with them on? What are they telling you to do if they're your consulting team? Those are two questions that are very important to me. Hey, Linda, thank you so much for, for, your, um, for your questions. So if you go to the EJ DevCo website, all of our properties that are under our control and in active development are, are listed there. Uh, so you'll, you'll see all of, and it gives the, even the, the, the level of, um, uh, of, of development that it's in, whether it's in pre-development, under active construction, or if it's already in service. So you'll see those at the bottom of the, uh, the EJ DevCo website. So those are listed. Uh, as far as how they were uh, acquired, some of those properties have been uh, under uh, JEI ownership. Uh, or were under JI ownership before being fully transferred into the development corporation uh, a few years back. Um, some of those were uh, either developed through, or uh, I shouldn't say developed, but acquired through um, uh, a tax foreclosure um, and, and the opportunity for JI to keep it from uh, going into uh, the, the, the um, tax foreclosure into the treasurer's hand. And so um, the in, in the city of Detroit, as many of you know, nonprofits oftentimes have the opportunity to pick up uh, properties before they slip into um, uh, into the, the, the treasurer's hand so that it can be preserved for some type of community redevelopment. Um, some many of the other properties uh, more, more recently as uh, um, as you see in the master plan, and we've indicated this before, is that um, those were a, a big part of uh, a Kresge um, program-related investment uh, into the, the, the DEVCO, which allowed us to go out and acquire many of these key assets to redevelop consistent with the community plan. And so, you know, the Kresge Foundation sponsored the um, and, and funded the master planning process that we undertook. Uh, with the community to take the community through this process so that those assets that we acquired could be developed consistent with the community's vision for those for those properties. So um, we're always happy to share, uh, you know, our holdings and our assets because our, our goal is to, is to develop them consistent with the community's vision uh, for uh, for these properties that we hold within the community. Um, and then to your to your last question, uh, which I, I really appreciate, um, is uh, when we uh, uh, relative to the, the company that we selected, um, I think as uh, I, I've said something before that I, I'm going to reiterate and then I'm also uh, going to um, get into how we selected the firm we selected, but um, our definition of inclusion does not mean exclusion. And so we, we're very intentional with trying to make sure that uh, we go after, um, you know, Detroit uh, uh, firms and Detroit uh, based um, uh, uh, employment contractors and things like that. And we, we always hire uh, a, a local Detroiters and local residents. So if you go on any of our construction sites, uh, including the Kresge building, for instance, where many uh, sub con or many contractors in the city of Detroit, many developers have kind of, um, you know, they've kind of thrown their hands up and say, it's hard to meet 50% or more of our hiring coming from Detroit and, and, and looking like Detroiters. We've not taken that position. We've been very intentional with going into the neighborhood and hiring uh, uh, local uh, residents, taking on some of the um, uh, some of the things that create barriers for them to participate. Um, and an example of that is the insurance uh, requirements sometimes to participate on city funded um, projects uh, can become a barrier for a local contractor. The bonding requirements sometimes can become a barrier. And so many times we're taking on that cost and that expense just uh, for the express purpose of making sure that we can hire local uh, local Detroit residents um, that look like uh, the folks in the neighborhood that, that um, we represent. And so the Kresge building is a good example where, you know, 80%, uh, roughly 76%, almost 80% of the employees in that building 
um, have come from the Detroit neighborhood and look like um, the, the folks that live in the neighborhood. As it relates to the, the team that we actually selected for the planning process, what, what I like to say is that um, that team represents a group of technicians who did technical work uh, that was informed by a group of on the ground folks that you see on this call. So uh, the DevCo team, uh, you know, uh, Lou, who you see, uh, myself, um, Marcus King, who's a licensed architect uh, and represents, you know, the less than 3% licensed black architects uh, in the, in the, in the country, um, and, as well as 2%, I'm sorry, Marcus, less than 2%. Of, of black architects in the country, and then David Howell, our, our real estate uh, development manager. Uh, we're all folks with a great deal of, of urban planning, uh, master planning, and urban design experience. Marcus has designed cities in China. Um, all of us have worked on uh, master plans in places like Atlanta and other cities like that. So our, our bringing in House of Levine out of Chicago um, really uh, was not to rely on them to to educate us, but it was to use what was um, a set of tools that only they have access to. Uh, and that's the really cool site that you see, uh, which is sort of a national model um, that uh, we were very, we're just very blessed to be able to roll it out. Um, Lou, is, is, as you guys have seen, sort of drives uh, the, the back door of, of the website uh, that the master plan is housed on. and uh, the engagement tools that we're now able to use to sort of real-time model with you, those tools didn't exist at any other firm. And so uh, one of the reasons for us selecting them was simply because they had um, you know, some nationally recognized tools for engagement that would allow us to really make sure that we got this right with the community. We did solicit proposals from uh, Detroit-based firms, and uh, we also looked for a diversity of um, Firms, but the reality was of all the teams that submitted in our fields, as I've identified, as I in indicated in architecture, uh, urban planning, and urban design, there's less than two percent of minorities in those fields. So it's very difficult to identify uh, any planning firm that's going to be representative of the communities um, uh, that we work in. But we are very blessed and privileged that you have four, uh, you know, really. Uh, qualified uh, folks uh, on our development team that were able to really guide them and help them understand uh, the work we were trying to do here and really use their technical expertise to help us uh, put together this plan. But much of what you see uh, in the plan really came from our on the ground communications with you as a community uh, and us understanding the neighborhood, being in the neighborhood, uh, you know, three of our four team members are residents of the neighborhood, uh, live in this this corridor, and so we really relied on their technical expertise. And so I, I hope that satisfies your 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 question. But um, um, I appreciate that question because it is very important to make sure that we we are providing opportunities, um, which, which is a big part of our inclusive principles to Detroiters as well as folks that look like uh, the community we work in. Thank you. I don't see any other questions. Uh, is there anyone else who wants to ask a question? Oh, Gwen has her hand up. Hi go. again. I'm so glad again to be a part of this question and answer sir, uh, session. What I wanted to know, there are different donors that donate to um, JEI to help you to be able to do all the things that you're doing. Is there a tax abatement that you receive where you don't have to pay taxes for a number of years on the property that you have acquired? Yeah, so um, so I think, again, uh, you know, we wanna make sure we separate uh, JEI as a nonprofit organization doing work and then the EJ DevCo is, uh, for-profit entity doing real estate development. So on the JEI side, it, as you've indicated, there's lots of grants and, and uh, support that go toward making sure that the programming uh, for all the work that Michelle team uh, does around the, the, the housing work and helping folks stay in their homes and finding resources uh, for, for those needs, as well as the safety work that we do, all of that 
you know, requires a good deal of philanthropic uh, support and, and, and contributions from those partners. On the real estate development side uh, of the house, um, many of our projects do re re rely on tax abatements. But what I can tell you is that absolutely none of the projects that you've seen in our pipeline uh, that have come uh, to market uh, have uh, received the tax abatement. Uh, the 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 Norma G's Caribbean Restaurant uh, currently, we pay taxes on that property, and a big reason for that is around this targeted redevelopment area tool that we've talked talked about, which allows us to reinvest those tax dollars that we spend or that our that our uh, tenants in those spaces uh, pay to make sure that development can keep happening and is reinvested back into this area. So I think that's a very important thing to note and, and really important um, reason why we want to continue to push this TRA tool is because in a traditional model, developers will usually come in and seek a lot of tax abatements and that, you know, for seven to 12 and, and even 20 years in some cases, um, those taxes can be abated and not contribute at all to the general fund. What we want to make sure is that these developments are not only contributing uh, back into the community, but also that as these developments happen, that there's uh, money that's reinvested back into this area um, directly to impact uh, future development and bring online a lot of those amenities and resources uh, that are needed. Uh, the only project that we do have that has received something close to an abatement is um, uh, the Marlboro Apartments, which has what's called a pilot, which is a payment in lieu of taxes. So it's uh, where we've entered into an agreement to pay uh, a, a certain amount of uh, taxes on that development, which would allow for us to be able to, to pr uh, provide deeper levels of affordability. So where there is a sort of a reduction of taxes, it's allowing for uh, a benefit for the area like um, deeper affordability on, on the apartments. And, and so that's the only project right now currently that has uh, that type of um, um, incentive. Uh, just one more question. And that is on the property that you have, a lot of it has been standing and it's empty, vacant, nothing has been done to it. If the average person in this community were to have some property and not do anything within a certain amount of time, they would either lose it or have to immediately fix it. So how do you get around not completing the construction of all the buildings that you have? So I think there's a there's a difference between carrying blighted uh, vacant property and uh, carrying property in what's called active development. So, um, and I, I definitely appreciate that question because there's, you know, we what we don't want to give off the the illusion is that it's okay to speculate on property or or sit and and, and hold property that uh, is is not being maintained and not being cared for. So as, as we've shown in, in many of these sessions is that um, there's a significant amount of gap on many of these projects uh, that they can't be financed, uh, can't put enough debt on it, um, and there's not enough equity or cash available to redevelop those properties. And, uh, and so um, it, in the absence of a development plan, you want to make sure you stabilize the property, make sure it's not contributing to blight, that you're uh, cleaning your property and maintaining those properties. So on, on each of our properties that are not in active development, um, we just like everyone else, we we get code enforcement. Um, you know, th that's why as Marcus mentioned, there's a um, uh, 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 new board up around the vanity ballroom to keep debris from falling off the building. That was to be in compliance with the city of Detroit um, to make sure we're not getting, continuing to get blight tickets. So we're, we're not exempt from enforcement like anyone else. We've gotten blight tickets. We've had to go down and address those um, and we're diligent in addressing those. Um, there are other property owners in the corridor who have uh, tens of thousands, not just hundreds, but tens of thousands of dollars of blight fees. We're not one of those. We we handle our our, our issues uh, as they come up, and anytime the city lets us know that there's an issue with one of our properties, we immediately address it. 
So um, I think um, one of the things that we want to make sure we're doing is, is not only just maintaining our properties, but encouraging other landowners um, in, the, in the corridor to maintain their properties as well. So we do hire uh, Phil Wassenauer, who lives within the, uh, in the Jefferson Chalmers neighborhood, uh, does all the landscaping and the maintenance, on, the grounds maintenance on all of our properties. So those properties that we are holding and maintaining, uh, we're, we're employing locally and making sure that uh, those properties are being maintained locally uh, until such time that we can move them into to active redevelopment. So the ones that you see that we're, we present in the community meetings, we're moving them as quickly as we can, working with the city of Detroit, working with uh, strategic neighborhood fund resources and, and the likes to make sure those move into development. Uh, and then also if a property owner uh, within the, the neighborhood comes to us and, and they are looking to redevelop their property and they have the same type of gaps, uh, we work with them to also try to um, uh, move their properties into development. So we don't have to develop the property our goal is to make sure it happens consistent with the community's vision and we'll help anyone who comes uh, to try to do that. Hey Derek, uh, we've got Linda Bowie uh, has a question and then after her, I wanna go to uh, our announcements because we've got a few announcements. All right, so we probably have three, what, about three more minutes, so uh, question, okay. Yeah. Okay, I'll be very quick with my question. Uh, my question concerns the restaurant, the Yellow Light restaurant and how they were vetted versus the crunchy chicken place that was initially standing there and slated to uh, be developed and open. How did that whole process go? And what happened with the crunchy chicken? What, is the, what was the vetting process of the yellow light? What do they serve? Um, how were they vetted with the community? Sure, so um, that, that particular business is not one that we controlled, so that wasn't a property that we owned. So that that particular uh, uh, owner did not have to come necessarily through this community engagement process. So that was an open market uh, property that was listed. Uh, Crispy Crunchy Chicken never opened, so the the owner of that um, decided uh, not to open the business and sell sell the building, um, and so. Um, unfortunately, he, he also passed away um, um, not too long ago, maybe a, a, a year ago or so. Um, and so uh, that, that business just never opened. Um, so it wasn't that one company or was chosen over the other. The business never moved in and never opened. The building sold by the private landowner and the folks at Crispy or at Yellow Light Donut came to us uh, uh, after they purchased the building to say, hey, we've got a, you know, a, a plan. We want to activate the building and, and this is what we're looking to do. Uh, are there resources to, to help us? And so uh, they did come to uh, many of the community meetings and including the, the master planning meeting back in August of mm -hmm. last year mm -hmm. uh, and served, uh, some of you may remember, they served about 300 donuts or so, some apple cider donuts and chocolate donuts uh, so that people can get an opportunity to taste uh, the donuts. And then they heard feedback from the community sitting in some of those sessions about the need for coffee and coffee drip. Uh, and so they began to offer some, some coffee offerings in there as well. Um, um, but it's uh, uh, um, a really cool concept uh, that they, uh, you know, presented uh, and, and, and brought to one of the community meetings. They made a presentation in one of the community meetings last year as well. Uh, but again, that was a private landowner. Um, and I think uh, while they didn't have to come to the community meetings, they took it upon themselves to, you know, come in, present their business, get some feedback, and then uh, put that, implement that into the restaurant that they were uh, opening there. Right. So I think they have limited hours. Um, Wednesday, uh, don't quote me, and I'm not sure if um, uh, Nico uh, or, or either one of the partners are on here. You, you know, Derek, they actually have started extending their hours more and more. Yeah, they have. Um, they, they've gotten a lot of business, um, partially because of the feedback that they got from the community. Um, they heard, even though they were opening a donut shop, they heard people say, we want chicken. Chicken, yeah. And there's literally chicken, chicken sandwiches they all over the their meat sandwich, yeah. because they wanted to hear what the community was saying. Um, and, and my hat's off to them because I don't, I, I have to say, if you're trying to start a business in a community, the best thing you can do is listen to the community and see what they want. 
and they made a very strong effort without any without anybody having uh, control over them. They made a, a decision to listen to what the community was talking about and take that feedback. So um, I'm going to go into announcements now. Uh, and the first announcement is, uh, as some of you know, uh, the Linux Center and AB Ford Park uh, is going through a, uh, some changes and they want the community to participate in, in the vision for this park and this community center. Uh, the next event is actually going to be at AB Ford Park on Saturday, September 12th from 10 a.m. to 2 p.m. Um, there will be social distancing. There will be masks available on site, but please bring your mask. Um, community members are not expected to stay the whole time, but feel free to. Um, it'll probably take about an hour or so to go through um, the activities that are going to be done at this event. Uh, this is sponsored by the City of Detroit uh, GSD Department, uh, and we are working with them on their community engagement. Uh, the next thing is Proposal N. Uh, Letty Azar from uh, District 4 uh, wants uh, people from the neighborhood to know about Proposal N. Uh, this is a proposal for neighborhood improvement. Uh, City Council wants to consider a $250 million bond, a proposal to address the 22,000 homes through rehabilitation and demolition. Uh, this will be on the ballot in November. Please take some time and, and review proposal in so you can decide how you feel about it, whether you're in agreement with it or not, because it will be on the ballot and we, we encourage you to vote how you feel about this proposal. Uh, also, the eviction ban has ended, but help is available. Uh, if you've been notified of an eviction, please contact the Detroit Eviction Prevention Line. Uh, that number is 866-313-2520, or you can go to uh, www.detroitevictionhelp.com uh, because they're, the city is trying to work with the community to avoid evictions. And our final announcement is our next community meeting. Uh, our next community meeting will be um, September 17th. We're going back to third Thursdays. So let, let your folks know it will be the exact same uh, web link. So if you want to hold on to this link for next month, you'll be able to click on the same link and get right into this community meeting. Uh, we'll be moving forward and into our focus groups and, and other activities. Um, and we're excited about it. And it is 729. I want to save you guys the rest of your evening. Thank you all for coming. Thank you for participating. We look forward to, to speaking with you and, and some of our focus groups and some of our future activities. Please go on the website. Please go on the website and, and see, um, go on EJ DevCo's website as well as the master plan. Uh, so you can go to ejdevco.com and just click on master plan and go through it. It's a really cool tool. Um, if, if there's someone who's interested in getting a PDF version, just email me and I'll see what we can do about that. Uh, Cause I know everybody doesn't want to use the internet and that's fine. Um, and remember, Marlboro Apartments has a wait list. If you know people from the neighborhood who are interested in moving into Marlboro Apartments, we are trying to prioritize people from the community, people who already live in Jefferson Chalmers who are looking to relocate in Jefferson Chalmers. So you can reach out to us and we'll direct you to the, uh, the company that is managing the properties. Thank you all for coming. Thank you, everyone. Thank you, everyone. Have a great Thanks. evening. Thanks, everybody. Good night. Good night.